Yes. So we decided to divide the, the paper between the two of us. We'll see how it works. In October 2018, uh, Vlad, slide number two. Good. In October 2018, a new schism polarized the Orthodox world, setting against each other two of its poles, the Ecumenical Patriarchate in Constantinople and the Moscow Patriarchate of the Russian Orthodox Church. Triggered by the decision of the Ecumenical Patriarchate to recognize the autocephaly, meaning independence, of the Russian Orthodox Church, the Moscow Patriarchate broke communion with it. The institutional communal dynamic triggered by these connected events and their effects on the ground reveal conflicting sovereignties and the change in relationship, I quote, between political communities and religious orders, between power and salvation, end of quote. Quotation was from the brief in Eastern Orthodoxy. These processes mobilize specific theological political formations such as canonical territory, autocephaly or sovereignty, and communion to address current geopolitical transformations and the globalization or deterritorialization of orthodoxy and the alignment of religious and secular forces around contemporary political mobilizations, nationalist and populist by their nature. By focusing on the theopolitical dimension in this paper, we argue for a reconsideration of the relation between religion and politics in ways that go beyond subordinating religion to secular politics. Moving the discussion beyond the post-secular debate and its intrinsic assumptions about the place of religion in modernity, such approach reveals the structural link between the religious and the political and its continuing relevance today. By putting this schism in perspective, uh, one, in this perspective, one realizes that it is integral to the history and institutional dynamics of orthodoxy, where the logics of communion and canonical territory at times converge and in others clash, channeling claims for sovereignty geopolitical projects and reciprocating changes that reshape churches and confessional boundaries. The idea to write this paper came from a conversation with Sonia Lurman and the other former participants of the prayer project and book. Some of them are present here. Hello, Angie and Simon. Um, Simeon, reflecting on the reverberations of the schism beyond Russia and Ukraine, we thought of bringing in the opposite perspectives on the conflict from the Russian and Ukrainian side, drawing, uh, drawing from a long-standing engagement with orthodoxy in these countries. Our research methods were far from conventional. We did not do ethnographic fieldwork, but became friends with other, our informants on the social media platforms we used, Facebook plus Russian uh, media platforms for Kontakte and an old style Russian media platform, The Living Journal. This made our knowledge partial, but allowed us to see the emotional side of the story, how people took the schism personally. Located in Budapest and in St. Petersburg, we were exposed to locally powerful streams of propaganda news about the schism in several languages. Whereas Vlad read pro-Ukrainian and anti-Russian propaganda, me had the opposite. Separation of the wheat from the chaff in this information stream was part of our ethnography. For Vlad, the effects of the schism in Ukraine had strong parallels with the 1990s religious revivals in Ukraine, where he did his fieldwork at the time, and the post-socialist world, itself another manifestation of the Russian world. Slide three. Thank you. 
the religious fragmentation at the time was a condition of the rapid pluralization of post-Soviet society, but the institutional reorganization of churches and the modes of social mobilization around it were shaped to a great extent by local historical traditions. The idea to create a united independent Ukrainian church was there from the beginning, but neither the state nor the Orthodox world were ready to accept it. The time was ripe now with the new elections coming up in Ukraine and the ongoing competition between Moscow and Constantinople. Vlad, next slide. No, the previous one. Yeah, the previous one. Yes, this one. Thank you. Uh, the difference this time was uh, how far the schism has reached beyond the post-Soviet space, revealing inherent tensions in contemporary orthodoxy between the unity of faith of orthodox churches and the territorial logic that divides them, and between national churches and an increasingly global deterritorialized diasporic community. In the Orthodox world, decisions about sovereignty and canonicity of churches are based on the authoritative interpretation of church tradition and its canons, which is always partial, given orthodoxy decentralized synodical system that lacks a supreme authority. While such decisions have to be considered, the break of communion which happened can be unilateral as was the Moscow Patriarchates against the Ecumenical Patriarchate. Concretely, this meant that Moscow is denying members of its church the right to partake in the sacraments of the Ecumenical Patriarchate, its priest to concelebrate with the other priests and refuses to pray for the Patriarch in the Holy Liturgy. More than just a political performance, this move led to an entire reorganization of institutional structures from national churches to local communities, with people and parishes forced to take sides in a conflict that threatened their belonging and access to the sacred. And now, Vlad, now it's your turn. Okay. Um, so, it's complicated to move in between these things. Just the theopolitics of communion have, have shaped the Christian world for many years, uh, for many centuries, with churches trying to settle questions of doctrine, legitimacy, and sovereignty. Uh, most famously in the great schism of 15, uh, 1054, when the Catholic and Orthodox churches broke communion and excommunicated each other. An act which hasn't really been overturned until this day. They cancelled the excommunication, but the churches didn't return to full communion, as you probably know. Um, in this case, however, we see that the Russian Orthodox Church has used its systematically this geopolitics of communion and territory um, in the, in since the 90s uh, to counter post-Soviet claims for independence of local national churches and sustain its vision uh, of the Russian world. Yet, what was a break of communion for the Russian uh, Orthodox Church represented a remaking of communion for the Orthodox Church of Ukraine, which, escaping from the Russian domination, joined the Orthodox world on, or is in process, because it's not recognized by all of them, uh, on equal footing with the other Orthodox churches. So in this sense, you can say that the theopolitics of communion here engendered both the making and the breaking of the Russian world. Um, now, the notion of communion, I'll come back to the other uh, image. Um, the notion of communion uh, articulates community formations between individuals and collectivities, uh, collectivities and institutions capturing the whole institutional dynamic of orthodoxy. The power of communion comes from the Eucharist, the body of Christ that, that constitutes the mystical church also. Um, historically, this notion developed from its sacramental rules to encompass the local community sharing the Eucharist. Also the spiritual communion of the living and the saints and the ecclesiastical unity of the churches that share the same faith, the Orthodox Commonwealth. In this sense, communion articulates the meaning of church, of church at all levels, from the individual to the institutional, 
and grants legitimacy and authority to them by virtue of the sovereignty of God over the Christian law. It also serves for the inclusion of churches in national communities, since it brings with it the concreteness of family intimacy, participation, and sharing that resonates with the nation and its imagined community. Communion in this sense grasps together the mystical, deification, theosis, the collective, the sacramental community, the practical, the liturgy, the doctrinal, the creed, one creed, historical, the communion of the living and the sense, moral po and political dimensions of orthodoxy. It unites, but it also divides uh, by separating believers and non-believers, the sinners and the virtuous, true and false churches. Um, let me just get to the next one. Slide true and false churches, um, as the history of Christianity shows. Um, Jana found this fantastic picture of the true church in the boat and, and all the dangers around it, all, all the schismatics and the, um, uh, the non heretics and, and, and the others. Um, so Thus, in, in this sense, uh, by uniting and dividing and, and separating people, it restructures the boundaries of the sacred and people's access to it, redefining uh, what the canonical church is um, and separating um, believers from the, the, the true believers from the schismatics. Its theological connotations are imbued with territorial claims and jurisdictional matters as the new schism and similar cases across the Orthodox world show. Um, a good example, thinking beyond the, uh, the Russian world, let's say, is the 2014 break of communion between the Orthodox Patriarchates of Antioch and Jerusalem over the jurisdiction of Qatar diocese. But I've just been reading about uh, um, some discussions between the Russian Church and the and the uh, uh, Patria, the Alexandria Patriarchate in terms of jurisdiction. So. There's, there's a lot going on, uh, something that we could discuss later on. Um, yet the Eucharistic communion also represents the universalism of Christ, Christianity, and the unity of churches in Christ, which makes it potentially subversive to worldly claims for power and authority over Christendom and the theopolitics of canonical territory. Commenting on Patriarch Kirill's decision to break communion, so the, the Moscow Patriarchate, the Patriarch Kirill's decisions to break communion with the ecumenical patriarchate, Russian Orthodox bloggers were quick to remind audiences that the church is led by God, and it is against Christianity itself to rip apart um, the Eucharist. The Eucharist is one unbroken and undivided, they wrote. It is the only one for all times till the end of the world. Only anti-Christians can try to rip apart the body of Christ. Um, this is a picture of uh, one of the first uh, leaders of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, Moscow Patriarchate, so the one that recognized uh, under the jurisdiction of Moscow Patriarchate, um, Metropolitan Alexander of Kiev, um, who, who shifted to the newly formed Ukrainian Church, um, the Ukrainian, the Orthodox Church of Ukraine, the one of the two of them. Um, Orthodox Christians tend to criticize um, the instrumentalization of religion for political purposes whether, purposes, whether in fights for territory, competition, or conflict for nationalist or imperialist pursuits. Um, regardless of their level of church attendance or religiosity, they are aware that political arguments couched in theological language might have a strong impact on their life. Following the new schism, people in Ukraine, Russia, and beyond were forced to make choices about their belonging and to join collective decision making about the affiliation of their parish church to one parish church to one church or the other. In this process, they could not really separate the political for the spiritual or sacramental. A very concrete issues came into play related to their access to the sacred, being able to bury their family members in the local cemetery, visiting other churches and other pilgrimage sites or monasteries, or blessing their Pascha and church at Easter. The arguments on both sides were quite similar, concerned with the truthfulness of their church and right, and coined in the language of communion and 
canonicity and sovereignty. I'll go back for a second to this map just to show you. This is a, a map which is, has, I don't think we actualized it, of the shifting of local parishes and the two cathedrals that you see there with reds from the Orthodox Church uh, in Ukraine that belonged to the Moscow Patriarchate to the newly formed and recognized independent Orthodox Church of Ukraine. Um, Redefinitions of community and belonging reflect the theopolitics of communion and territory on the ground. The Ukrainian state, for example, has deferred this whole process to the churches, allowing local communities to decide the change of affiliation between Moscow and Kiev patriarchates, as you've seen on the, on the map, just as they did in the 1990s. Here, there are some interesting parallels that we can talk about maybe later in the discussion. Counter to the collectivist vision of Orthodox churches, which assume that everyone living in the territory of a particular parish or eparchy or patriarchate, metropolitanate, belongs to it, the law emphasizes the individual rights of believers to choose their churches. This led to questions about what constitutes a religious community and who belongs to it, questions that were not really asked uh, much before becoming a matter of communion versus territory. Um, in fact, who lives on, on, on that territory versus who belongs to, uh, to the sacramental community. In practice, this involved careful scrutiny of regular and occasional churchgoers, sectarians and residents of other faiths, as well as cultural or nominal Orthodox and other in-between categories um, with quite funny examples of how people try to think of, of, uh, of, of what makes a, a proper Orthodox Christian who, who should stay or in, who decide to vote or not. Um, the, the, I think the, the image here uh, reflects very well this kind of discussion about which comes actually from um, an, an NGO that was related to the Moscow Patriarchate that there is a distinction and you see it uh, in, 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 in also in the way they are portrayed between what it means the territorial community, so people living on the territory of that parish and the religious community. And, and um, it's, it's a nice contrast between the two and how they are imagined and the sign that they are not really the same thing. Um, uh, just to make sure that people who belong, uh, who, who can vote on where the, a church can go are only the, the religious uh, those represented the religious community. So most Orthodox communities in all this um, uh, uh, shifting on the ground and, and, and uh, oscillated between the two principles, sharing territory and sharing communion. But they assume from the start an overlapping of the political and the religious community from the start. Um, two more examples of that. Activists from uh, one of the villages um, visiting the metropolitan, so that you see in the pictures down there, um, Antoni Makota of the newly formed Orthodox Church of Ukraine to ask for the transfer of their parish to the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, despite what you see on the other side is the opposition of parish members and priests. So at times it, within this provoked divisions within communities as well, um, and mobilized people also beyond the, the territory of the community. So they moved between um, um, parishes and communities in trying to, um, in trying to um, convince them to vote to shift to one church or stay with the other. Um, the schism has polarized communities in this sense, setting committed believers, minority, gathered around the Eucharistic celebration who remain committed to the Orthodox, to the Russian Orthodox Church for fear of becoming schismatics against the territorially defined political community that joined the new Ukrainian church and state. Now I am letting Jana to conclude. Um... So to conclude, the making or breaking of communion brings in question about the sacred orthodoxy, right faith, belonging and salvation that concern churchgoers and nominal orthodox alike. 
historically evolved geopolitical formations such as communion, autocephaly, canonical territory are intrinsic mechanisms for grappling with individual collective church sovereignty uh, versus authority, universalism versus particularism, and institutional dynamics they trigger. Drawing parallels with the 1990s in terms of institutional dynamics and religious nationalist mobilization, we can see how the theopolitics of communion and territory remain effective in reorganizing religious structures and people's lives. This means that religion is not just a continuation of politics by other means, but a space for divinely sanctioned action that can divide but also unite people and churches and unsettle claims for power and canonical territory with reference to the Russian world and not only. By choosing the kingdom of God over these worldly sovereigns, Orthodox Christians, some of them, may still be able to transcend institutional boundaries and divisions precipitated by such politics of differentiation. And after all, Orthodox Christianity has a long history of schisms that have provided new beginnings. And each time the possibility of reimagining a Christian community that is truer to God. However, the revolutionary potential of such beginnings tends to, be, tends to be tamed by the need to inscribe it in the church tradition where change is encompassed by the continuity of faith. And as always, the speed of changes triggered by the new schism will have to adjust to the slow historicity of orthodoxy. So we, uh, we want to, uh, to end here. And uh, we want to leave some of our you know, thoughts and considerations for the future discussion. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. I, I'm, I'm sending a kind of metaphorical uh, applause across. Yes. Uh, thank you. And please uh, bear in mind, keep your questions uh, for that paper. Uh, we're going to move on to the other papers, but obviously we'll be wanting to think across these papers. And I think you're going to actually that there's an awful lot from, from what uh, Jean and Vlad said that it has a curious kind of complementarity to what Victoria is now going to be uh, talking about. Uh, and um, Victoria's paper is going to be is uh, New Martyrs and the Making of Transnational Conservative Publics. So Victoria. Thank you, Simon. I was going to share my slides in a second. I hope you can see the presentation now. Uh, in this talk, I will draw on the example of the developing cult of a soldier Evgeny Rodionov to explore how the imagery of neo-martyrdom is mobilized by conservative actors to construct a memory-centered affective public culture at home as well as to project the image of Russia as the defender of the Orthodox world abroad. A participant of the first Chechen campaign, 18 years old private Evgeny Rodionov was taken prisoner alongside with three other soldiers in February 1996, following the Chechen militants attack on their blog post. After more than three months of captivity, Rodionov was beheaded on May 23, 1996, allegedly for his refusal to take off his cross and convert to Islam. Shortly after they were taken prisoner, all the four soldiers were declared deserters by their military commanders who sought to avoid assuming responsibility for their lives. The truth about the circumstances surrounding Rodionov's death were only revealed thanks to the relentless efforts of his mother, Lyubov Rodionova, who refused to believe that her son was a deserter and personally went to Chechnya to uncover his fate. After almost nine months of ceaseless searching, Lyubov has finally managed to meet with her son's murderer, who narrated to her the circumstances of the soldier's execution, and in exchange for a ransom, agreed to reveal the location where the bodies of the four soldiers were buried. As the details of Rodionov's gruesome execution became publicly known, the soldier came to be perceived by many Russians as a symbol of heroism and spiritual strength, some Orthodox nationalists going as far as demanding his official canonization as a martyr. 
In 2004, upon revising Rodionov's case, the Orthodox Church refused to canonize a soldier, citing the impossibility of verifying the circumstances of his death as a reason. Despite the absence of canonization, Rodionov remains an object of popular veneration, with thousands of pilgrims visiting his grave in the village of Satinoruskaya near Moscow uh, to commemorate him. Rodionov's venerators are very far from being homogenous in terms of their political leanings, ranging from the Soviet regime sympathizers to anti-Soviet and anti-communist nationalists who identify with the ideals of orthodoxy and monarchism. Nonetheless, they are united by what I call moral conservatism, a discourse that casts post-Soviet Russia as dominated by naked cynicism and nihilism and requiring a spiritual revival. I suggest that moral conservatism is best understood not through the lens of any specific political ideology, but rather as a distinct moral subjectivity one that privileges idealism and passion over pragmatic rationalism, communalism over individualism, and ethical striving and truth-seeking over the comfortable consumer lifestyle. A highly polyvalent symbol that to different audiences represents radical religious devotion, a stoic commitment to military honor, or both, the figure of Rodionov ultimately embodies the central ideal of moral conservatism a search for transcendence and preparedness to die for one's values. The geopolitical developments of recent years, including the conflict in Eastern Ukraine and the Russian military intervention in Syria, created new possibilities for the mobility of the soldier scout, as servicemen and volunteers traveling to the contested places have adopted the figure of this holy warrior as their patron saint. Lubov told me that since 2014, she has been caught, contacted by many servicemen wishing to take the cross her son was wearing when he was executed as a protective talisman on their assignment journeys. Thus, between 2014 and 2016, Rodionov's cross was taken by different units of the Ministry of Emergency Situations on their humanitarian trips to Crimea, Donbass, and Syria. One example of a paramilitary group that has adopted Rodionov as a patron saint is the Patriotic Union Rubesh, established in 2013 by a former bodyguard, Vladimir Ivochkin. The union's main goal is to offer the veteran, veterans of the bodyguard forces an opportunity to continue serving their country through patriotically oriented activities. In 2015, the group has sponsored the installment of a memorial stone for Rodionov in the World War II memorial complex in Snigiri village near Moscow. The union has also made efforts to spread the word about the new saint in Eastern Ukraine. Since the beginning of the violent conflict there, the veterans have been involved in delivery of humanitarian aid to the disputed regions of Donetsk and Lugansk. During each trip, they took with them the large packs of printed laminated icons of Rodionov, which they offered as gifts to the border guards at the Russian and Ukrainian checkpoints, to the local residents and soldiers they encountered in the combat zone. Some of Rubesh members believe that prayers to Rodionov have protected them in the moments of dangers during their perilous journeys. According to Rubesh members, Rodionov is well known in the among the Orthodox believers in Eastern Ukraine. As Vladimir explained, I quote, at the front line, where every minute a mine or a shell can hit you, the guys take Evgeny's small icons, put them inside their bulletproof vests, and just go around like that with them, end of quote. A friend of Vladimir's, who was present during our conversation, himself a Chechen war veteran, added that he prays to Rodionov daily, always using one and the same formula, I quote, Warrior Matya Evgeny, save and protect our country and the Russian people. Help the people of southeastern Ukraine, Novorossiya, and Russia. End of quote. This evocative statement, this evocative prayer statement, presents Rodionov, who once fought for the, for the preservation of the territorial integrity of the Russian state in Chechnya as a protector of the broader Russian world that is the territories historically understood as part of the Russian sphere of influence. However, 
as I will argue in this talk, the promotion of Rodionov's cult outside Russia goes beyond an attempt to establish yet another unifying symbol for the Russian world. Rather, it often represents an effort to forge a larger transnational moral community, united by orthodox and traditionalist values, as well as by a shared position on historical and recent military conflicts, including World War II, Cyprus, Chechnya, Serbia, Eastern Ukraine, and Syria, a position that tends to generally align with the geopolitics of the Russian state. The example of Roman Ilyushkin, the icon painter who created Rodionov's icon in the early 2000s, illustrates well how the soldier's figure can be adopted to forge just such a transnational community. Since 2012, Roman, in cooperation with the fund, the Union of Serbian and Russian People, have been involved in the organization of friendly matches between Serbian and Russian youth football teams in Moscow Oblast. In 2014, Roman took the soldier's icon on a tour organized around Crimea and Sevastopol for a Serbian football team. The following year, the icon painter organized a tour around the People's Republic of Donetsk with a photo exhibition entitled We Want Peace that featured photographs documenting the destruction caused by the conflicts in Afghanistan, Serbia, Chechnya, and South Ossetia. A central item of the exhibition was Rodionov's icon placed in the middle of the exhibition hall on an improvised altar. During his stay in Eastern Ukraine, Roman visited the churches of Donetsk and nearby villages to offer the local parish members a chance to venerate the soldier's icon. Roman believes that Rodionov presents an inspiring example for the young men fighting in Eastern Ukraine. As he put it, I quote, young, young guys upon seeing Rodionov's image realized that even if they die, their death will contribute to the same cause as Zhenia's death did. Zhenia is a nickname for Evgeny. They are also wearing crosses over there. They are orthodox. They felt some kind of reassurance that with the arms in their hands, they are protecting the motherland the same way Zhenia did back there in Chechnya. They are now protecting the peace and our motherland over there where the new border between the good and the evil now lies." End of quote. Let me now provide another, a bit longer quote in which Roman recounts his experience, his impressions from attending the the opening ceremony for the Monument of the Unknown Soldier together with the Serbian combat volunteers in the town of Ambrosivka, Ambrosivka in the Donetsk region. Evgeny's icon was at the opening of the monument. And during the entire ceremony, this image was held by a Serbian militiaman and by my own son, who had recently completed his service in the Russian army. It was a kind of Russian, Serbian Russian brotherhood. And next to the icon, among the flags of the Donetsk People's Republic, stood the Serbian banner that I brought there, and the banner of Russia. And Zhenia's image was a special spiritual force of the entire ceremony. It was all happening right by the end of a freshly right by the side of a freshly dug grave, because this was not just an opening of a memorial but also a reburial of the remains of Soviet soldiers who died during the Great Patriotic War near Donbass. It held particular symbolism for the hundreds of attendees. Among the attendees were militiamen, children, members of the search clubs, and among them the icon of a Russian soldier who died in a faraway Chechnya, died for the cause of peace and protection of his fatherland, for our orthodox motherland." End of quote. For Roman, the soldier thus represents not just the symbol of a Chechen campaign, but a broader ideal of military self-sacrifice that he expects to be equally relatable to the Serbian militiamen, servicemen fighting in Eastern Ukraine, and the broader public committed to honoring the Soviet participants of the Second World War. The capacity of Rodionov's story to generate a strong emotional response across different audiences was also recognized by the All-Russian Veteran Association by Voya Bratstvo, or the Military Brotherhood, which in 2016 has established a medal for loyalty in Rodionov's honor, 
to be awarded to individuals who have contributed to the strengthening of Russian statehood and revival of Orthodox faith in Russia. In 2019, to commemorate the fifth anniversary of the Russian Spring, the organization handed out the medals with Rodionov's image to the members of the Sevastopol Berkut, a former Ukrainian special police unit that facilitated the Russian annexation of the Crimean Peninsula. Rodionov's growing fame in the Orthodox world makes him an increasingly appealing tool for cultural diplomacy to be adopted by the state officials. For example, in 2016 and 2017, the Russian delegation headed by Dmitry Sablin, a member of the United Russia Party and vice president of Bayevoye Bratstvo, visited the Greek Orthodox Church in the Syrian city of Baniyas, where Rodionov is celebrated as a saint. Rodionov's icons can also be found in churches in Ukraine, Cyprus, Greece, and Serbia, and Moldova. With the keen interest in the soldier's story in these countries, creating new opportunities for the Russian political actors interested in the establishment of closer ties with the local Orthodox communities. I would like to conclude with a brief speculation about the future of both Rodionov's cult and the new Russian conservative public sphere, which is characterized by military patriotism, the merging of nationalist and religious symbols, and emotionally charged memo memorial events. Having initially emerged as a dynamic and compelling counterculture, in recent years, the post-Soviet moral conservatism has been gradually evolving into a hegemonic cultural form, actively promoted and sometimes aggressively imposed by the state. Yet, this growing institutionalization threatens to undermine the very spirit of authenticity and organic enthusiasm that has made this culture so powerfully persuasive in the first place. As it becomes increasingly more formalistic, coercive, and ubiquitous, the conservative culture thus risks repeating the fate of the late Soviet public culture that was dismissed by many of its participants as pakazucha, that is, a show. Whereas the future of the conservative public culture in Russia remains uncertain, Rodionov's commemoration, insofar as it retains its grassroots nature, is likely to persist, regardless of the broader shifts of attitude towards state-sponsored military patriotism. Moreover, as long as sectarian violence remains a steady feature of the modern world, the soldier scout, which came to represent militant orthodoxy and resistance to Islamization, has a strong potential to continue burgeoning in the broader orthodox world traveling to new terrains and winning over new audiences. And I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Victoria. Uh, and I think your yeah, wonderful paper there. Yes, wonderful. Um, and um, we're going to move, move on from that. But again, I think over themes, many overlapping themes, um, as we move uh, to Mikhail Suslov, who is Assistant Professor um, in the Department of Cross-Cultural and Regional Studies at the University of Copenhagen. And uh, Mikhail is going to give us a paper called the, uh, well, again, it, it, I think it resonates very interestingly with what you've been saying, Victoria. This one's called The, the Geopolitical Imagination of the Russian World. Uh, Mikhail. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Thanks for having me here. Uh, so this uh, uh, talk is continuation of my reflections on the contemporary Russian regime ideology. Uh, I consider the Russian world as a political concept or rather geopolitical concept. Uh, it is pretty important to differentiate the Russian world as the meme and the Russian world as the political concept. And my contention is that the Russian world should be understood not as a meme, but as a pretty stable, um, important uh, geopolitical concept. So when we are talking about various political memes, um, say uh, Navarossia or uh, Ukra fascism, uh, Crimea is ours, whatever, they follow pretty distinctive uh, epidemiological model of distribution. So you have a spike and then they slightly go down in popularity in the media sphere. When it comes to the Russian world, <coughs> nothing of this kind is um, 
visible. So uh, the Russian world was pretty unimportant concept before 2008, uh, 2014. Uh, then you have this spike in 2014, and then the, the number of hits, the number of words in the Russian press kind of stabilized more than that. Uh, it, it, uh, its uh, highest level was in 2018. Um, it should be also kept in mind, as by the way of reality check, that the Russian world is perhaps not the most popular geopolitical concept in Russia as of today. Um, it is somewhat dwarfed by the concept of Eurasia, which is numerically um, simply more popular. Uh, but the Eurasia, the concept of Eurasia is somewhat losing momentum today. It's going remarkably down, whereas the Russian world is more or less stable. Um, yeah, it is way, way more popular than the Russian civilization concept, for example, uh, orthodox civilization. Uh, and these uh, two different iterations of uh, the Russian civilization, Ruski and Rasiski civilization as well. Um, so uh, my contention is that the Russian world is the concept. And uh, in my presentation, I would, um, I would like to discuss two aspects of the problem. First, I would like to identify the major conceptual change which happened in post-Soviet Russia with this concept of uh, Russian world. And second, I will identify the major aspects of political meanings of the term Russian world as of today. Uh, so when speaking about the conceptual change, uh, it changed the concept of the Russian world, changed two times. Uh, first, the first manifestation of the concept of uh, the Russian world, this is um, uh, in the 90s, and this concept accentuated diaspora per se. So the concept was put forward in order to think, to, in order to invent the frame in which Russia and Russian diaspora could be, uh, could be considered as a single geopolitical body. So during the 90s, the concept of the Russian world meant that uh, the Russian diaspora can provide Russia the most valuable things, meaning capitals, technologies, access to the outer world in general. And the accent was put specifically on diaspora. Diaspora was considered to be the most important part of the Russian world. Uh, when Putin came to power in, um, roughly speaking, 2000s, uh, the meaning of the Russian world changed. This was also the period when uh, the Russian Federation came up with the whole um, number of uh, infrastructural projects so institutions like the Russian World Foundation was set up. Um, and the Russian world changed its meaning from uh, this diaspora to a more state-centric meaning. So now if you think about the Russian world as the meta political metaphor, the Russian world could be represented as a kind of octopus uh, with the center of gravity in Russia per se, in the Russian state, Russian Federation, and with multiples, multiple tentacles across the world, which are helping Russia as the state to project its power, to project its soft power, but not probably all, uh, not only soft power. Um, on the turn of 2000s and 2010s, the most momentous change uh, in, of, the, of this concept uh, happened. This is the very major flip of the meaning of the Russian world. Why I call this uh, the major flip? Uh, well, basically because uh, because before uh, the meaning of the Russian world was defined or decant uh, or decon decontestated by its proximity with the um, conservative liberalism. After that period, after roughly 2009, 2012, the concept of the Russian world became um, associated with the ideology of conservative communitarianism. Uh, so this is a really most important change in uh, 
in uh, intellectual history of Russia in the past 30 years, but also in the history of the concept of the Russian world. So I'll try to explain uh, what actually happened. Uh, in 2000s, the Russian world concept was uh, implicated with two other concepts, the concept of uh, sovereign, sovereign democracy and the concept of multicultural um civic inclusive nation. Yeah. Both concepts have a very strong liberal bearing. Actually, if you uh, dig to the bedrock of uh, Surkovian narrative about, about um, sovereign democracy, this is uh, classic liberalism. Yeah? So we are the community of adult, independent people, and we can decide for ourselves what is good life for us and how uh, we want to build our life. Uh, so uh, from this, Surkov argued further on, so if we can choose whatever life we, we want, we can decide to be different from the Western Europeans, for example, or Americans. But we do not want to be to become different because we pick up the same, we choose the same values, the same values of democracy, liberal democracy, um, um, freedom, uh, personal freedoms, and and human rights. So uh, if you follow if you follow me on this, the logic, the initial logic of uh, the Russian world and um, sovereign democracy was like that: we can be different, but we do not want to be different. Yeah? Uh, after this shift, after this flip, 2009-2012, and uh, those who follow Russia, they um, keep keep an eye on Russian developments. Do you understand what ha what happened? This this is about the uh, re-election of uh, Putin. This is about uh, protest in Moscow. This is about the accumulated dissatisfaction with with the, the West in Russia and so on and so forth. So I'm not dwelling on that. Uh, just want to identify the new meaning of the Russian world since 2012. Here I would like to identify five most important parameters or five most important aspects of this term. So first, as I mentioned, uh, the Russian world became, the, um, became associated with the conservative communitarianism, meaning that now you understand the community of Russians or community of the Russian world as something where you are born into and you cannot simply change it. Yeah? You cannot choose, you cannot pick up uh, whatever identity you want. If since you are born into this community, you, um, you, cannot, you cannot leave it, you cannot quit it without delivering uh, damage to your own identity. Uh, in this context, I can uh, recollect the concept of civilizational choice advanced by Patriarch Kirill in the aftermath of uh, the Ukrainian crisis. So the concept of civilizational choice was precisely to grasp this idea. Ukraine, which was initially part of the Russian world, is now opting for a different um, civilizational path, which means that Ukraine is destroying its own identity. Yeah? So this is a conser conservative communitarian agenda. You cannot simply uh, freely choose your identity. Uh, so this is um, this uh, conservative communitarianism. The second aspect of the term Russian world here is the concept of gross realm, yeah, or large space, large space, which is of course uh, taken from um, Carl Schmidt. And we know that in Kremlin, you have the whole bunch of people who are so much infatuated with uh, Karl Schmidt. Um, and uh, this gross realm imagination has two aspects. aspects. First, uh, in, contradistinction, in contradistinction to the uh, sovereign democracy concept, the gross realm concept means that you are already different, yeah? So you were born already into community which is distinctive from others. And that is why you can, uh, yeah, you can be sovereign. So this is the twist of logic which kind of reverses uh, the causal connection. So if uh, the initial idea was we are adult, morally autonomous and we can be, and that is why we can become um, different from you. Here you have kind of the reverse. You are already different and that is why you, um, you can be fully independent. Uh, the second aspect of this trust round thinking is uh, that the Russian world is larger than Russia per se. Yeah? 
than the Russian Federation as the state. And this is important. Um, this is important to understand in the con in the context of uh, geopolitical right sizing. Uh, geopolitical imagination embarks on right sizing the nation, on imagining a nation larger than itself. Well, think about pan nationalism, think about uh, continentalism, when the nation feels uh, vulnerability, yeah? when, when it feels that it cannot compete internationally. So the Russian world as the cross realm is the attempt to enlarge the scale and claim uh, ultimate sovereignty that we can. Uh, we can compete on a par with um, NATO, for example. So this was um, communitarianism, cross realm. The third aspect of the Russian world is the concept of civilization. Uh, the concept of civilization is understood in connection with the Russian world in a very particular sense. Uh, this is the organic vision. Yeah? Civilization is the organic body or geopolitical body. And at the organic body, which, uh, um, which has its kind of life trajectory, it was born to some, in some point, it is uh, passing through the stages of maturity, decline, and then it goes to its uh, uh, grave. In this context, the concept of the Russian world is very much connected with the vision or political metaphors of death, destruction, decay, and decline. And you can see it everywhere in the political mainstream and social media as well, that people are using words, uh, Russian world, in a very particular context, like uh, aggression against the Russian world. Russian world is torn apart. They, whomever this they are, they want to kill the Russian world. They want to destroy the Russian world. Uh, and even um, one of the foremost conservative um, intellectuals in Russia, Polyakov, said, uh, this is meaning, if my memory serves, meaning the, um, the uprising against Ukraine in Donbass, this is the real genocide of the Russian world. Yeah, so the Russian world is the body which is suffering, which is vulnerable, which is fragile, and there are lots of enemies who are um, destroying the Russian world in multiple ways. Um, this was the third aspect. The fourth aspect is uh, messianism. Yeah. So if you if you understand the Russian world as a civilizational body, as a living body of a civilization, then the world in your mind is like the ecological system where every organism has its design and purpose yeah, and its place in this ecological system. So the Russian world has its own place and purpose in the world. Um, I don't want to dwell on the religious aspects of messianism, which is also relevant in this context, but I would like to point at three iterations or manifestations of um, political messianism. Uh, so here I um, tap into the mainstream political discourses, basically on um, uh, things uh, which were published by Izvestia and other major uh, Russian official publishing outlets. So these are three iterations of uh, messianism. First, Russia as the Russian world, as a specific civilization, is the peacekeeper of the world. Yeah? So this is the world global balancer. Uh, Russia is bringing peace to the international community. This is the um, very central concept which was advanced by people like Isaev, one of the leaders of United Russia Party, Narishkin, Kosachev, uh, many others. So they basically argued that instead of speaking about about social justice, we have to speak about international justice. And Russia is precisely standing guard on um, international justice, uh, defending the weak against the strong and restoring justice in whatever sense they mean. The second iteration of Messianism is that Russian world is the harmonious union of the people. This is unique. Um, here I can uh, refer to Putin's famous or infamous article uh, about the national question from 2012, he argued that the Russian world is, I'm quoting, harmony of identities inside Russia. Yeah. 
So in contradistinction to a liberal understanding of multiculturalism, Russia has its own solution. It is peaceful coexistence of multiple faiths and uh, nations. And we can show this example to the world. And finally, the third manifestation of this uh, political, official, mainstream messianism is the concept of traditional values. And this is so much um, uh, debated now, so that uh, I guess I don't need to spend much time uh, on that. I can quote um, just probably one guy. This is Shuvalov, Yuri Shuvalov, one of the leaders of United Russia Party. And uh, he argued that the Russian world is consolidator of all traditional forces in the world. Yeah. Um, the final point which I want to make, if I have a couple of minutes to finish up. Um, good, thanks. Uh, the final fifth point or aspect of this Russian world and political imagination is that now it is relatively disconnected from diaspora per se, yeah. which is pretty paradoxical and counterintuitive, but today the Russian world is not embracing the Russian diaspora, but rather alienating the Russian diaspora. So it, it, it needs, in its initial design, the concept of the Russian world was precisely to embrace it and make sense of the Russian diaspora, which is so, uh, so populous. And now uh, the Russian world is usually used in the context which somehow puts them aside outside of the Russian world. Think about the um, Corona crisis and all these causes associated with um, the Russian attempts to bring Russian compatriots from different countries to Russia, evacuation of uh, Russian compatriots, Russian citizens. Uh, on the media, on the mainstream media, if not predominant, but at least quite visible, quite capable kind of um, nar narrative in connection with this evacuation is the narrative of prodigal sons. Yeah, they, they, that they're probably not worthy of being saved, but Russia is still so benevolent that Russia is saving them. Uh, also, I can point at um, um, quite glaring example of this alienation of Russian diaspora. Uh, this is uh, Kananenko's, one of the pro-Kremlin uh, influences, uh, opinion that there are no Russians in London there are no Russians in Riga. Yeah. So if you want to be Russian, you have to go back to Russia. If you want to live in London, you are no longer Russian. <laughs> so this is a very interesting twist of uh, thinking in, in uh, contradistinction to what was uh, in the 90s or even 2000s. And by way of conclusion, I would like just to mention the recent amendments. Uh, you probably know on the 1st of July this year, Russia got its new old constitution, amended constitution, and they have a new article, which is the article 69, part three, which explicitly says that Russian Federation is supporting compatriots abroad and facilitates the preservation of uh, the old Russian cultural identity. Yeah, I think I can stop at this point, thanks. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Mikhail. Uh, uh, yeah, fascinating. And um, one of the kind of fascinating themes there is the kind of alienation or not of the diaspora and then how that plays out in relation to the other papers uh, that we've been hearing today. I think also just, just very briefly, it's one thing that strikes me at the moment is we've got Mikhail there talking about geopolitics in a particular kind of way. And then thinking about comparing that uh, with uh, Vladjana's discussion of uh, in, a, in a sense, the Russian world in relation to uh, uh, the orthodox, the institutions of the orthodox church as a particular kind of medium. And then thinking about that and comparing that with, with Victoria's discussion of a much more kind of popular aesthetics, which has its own kind of uh, uh, geopolitical uh, implication as well, uh, uh, occurring across a particular kind of landscape. So we've got, I think, these interesting different shapes of the Russian world and mediations of the Russian world being being discussed here. What we're going to do is to have uh, two uh, comments from uh, discussants before we move into our more general discussion. So again, please keep your questions. Uh, we'll be wanting to him very soon. But first of all, I'm going to call on Sarah Ricardi-Swartz 
who's going to be our first uh, discussant. Sarah is postdoctoral fellow at the Center for the Study of Religion and Conflict in Arizona uh, State University. And uh, her first, I just want to mention her first book manuscript, Political Apostasy, American Conversions to Russian Orthodoxy During the Trump-Putin Era. Kind of fascinating commentary in itself on what we're uh, discussing. So um, Sarah, over to you for your first set of uh, discussants comments. Thanks so much, Simon. Um, I'm going to start out really quickly because I want to be mindful of time and I know that all of you have questions for these really rich presentations. Um, a little bit of background about uh, me. I've been working on materiality and polity for the better part of the last decade, particularly in the Russian world outside of the normative um, geographies and spaces of Russia. And for the past six years, I've worked exclusively with uh, converts to the Russian Orthodox Church outside of Russia and the American South, who are both political and spiritual converts to what they see as a, a post-Soviet Holy Rus. So I'm very glad to respond to these three presentations and pre-circulated papers. Um, they've given me a lot to think about actually for my own work, so thank you for that. These papers have provided us with distinct yet connected, as Simon pointed out, material modalities through which to view both Russian geopolitical imaginaries and ways of world making. And as I move through my responses, I'll offer a couple of questions and comments to presenters that might provide avenues for further inquiry or contemplation if we have time. When assessing materiality, religion, and politics, I think that scale is always of great importance. So I want to begin with Victoria's paper, which draws us into the story of cultic devotion and Orthodox Christian patriotism. Victoria shows us the effective ways in which an image of a teenage private who was allegedly martyred by militants because he refused to relinquish his cross and convert to Islam has become a pictorial piece of propaganda, an instrument of political instability that actively aids the mobilization of conservative, perhaps even radical ideologies of domination and power beyond the Russian border, beyond the Russian world perhaps. Despite the lack of official canonization by the Russian Orthodox Church, the visage of this young saint in art, icons, medals, and other vernacular sensory formations parallels, according to Victoria, the transformation of Russian nationalistic politics and patriotism. And looking at his venerator, she argues rightly that the martyr embodies the core principles of moral conservatism, namely the quest for transcendent reality and the courage to die for one's moral convictions. And ultimately, she suggests that the cultic devotion creates a, a public sphere bringing together orthodox mysticism and romanticized visions of imperial Russia with Soviet nostalgia to promote a new type of war patriotism. And as someone who writes about the American orthodox convert veneration of the royal or new martyrs, Tsar Nicholas II and his family, I'm inclined to agree with your assessment of the venerators you've encountered. And I'm curious if you see the royal martyrs as part of this nostalgic revival of imperial strength in the Russian world. And I do have a few questions, but since I'm bound to the clock, I probably have more than a few. Um, I'll offer two here. First, I'm struck by your use of moral conservatism as an ideological positioning of post-Soviet Russia as entrenched in nihilism and needing salvific resuscitation through communal passion for truth, honor, and ethics. My interlocutors who are American converts to Russian Orthodoxy would ascribe to a framework of moral conservatism, one that they believe is already embedded into the sociality of post-Soviet Russia. In other words, for them, Russia doesn't need to be saved. Only Russia can save the world, um, to borrow a turn of phrase from an informant. Question one, part B. How much of this moral conservatism is part of the globalized rhetoric of fear and alterity that we find in the new global culture wars. And here I'm thinking of Christina Stokel's work and I'm also thinking about research on both European Islamophobia and laws and public opinions regarding the bodily displays of Christian materiality such as wearing a cross in Europe. Question two, beyond the new martyrs, I see the veneration um, it parallels with the vernacular and cultic devotion to American convert monk, Father Sarah from Rose, who we know is venerated in both the United States and Russia, um, even though he hasn't been officially canonized. Both figures, not official saints, have become central transtemporal actors in conservative religious political imaginaries that focus on monarchic imperial visions of Russian power for the eschaton. And I wonder what that might tell us about shifting contemporary views of church-state relations and Christian anxieties of the secular, or in the case of 
uh, Rodionov, uh, Islamic other, both in Russia and abroad. Anxieties of the other revealed in the disputed, even broken ecclesiastical sovereignties are also part of Jana and Vlad's article. The anxieties of the Moscow Patriarchate are expressed in its imaginative theopolitical insistence on being the third Rome as a way to leverage imperial history in their vision of how global orthodoxy should be governed. Drawing on the 2018 break in the spiritual communion between the MP and the EP, Jana and Vlad focus on how schism, how the concept of rupture might help us better understand the institutional logics and dynamics of Orthodox Christianity. This piece captures the political maneuverings that have for so long been embedded into the corporate hierarchical structures of orthodoxy, showing how the destabilizing force of schism creates ontological angst regarding shared communion and territorial claims through the various levels of orthodox and secular polity, while also serving to support religious boundary making schemas, us versus them, sick or sinful versus well or repentant, clean versus polluted, et cetera. And I want to zero in on this idea of boundary making. And while the authors focus on spiritual hygiene, which is such a great term, and the materiality of unity via the shared Eucharistic cup and spoon, their piece was published right around the time we began to feel the first effects of the rapidly globalizing COVID-19 pandemic. And since the pandemic, the purity, unity, and undivided nature of the Eucharist in Orthodox Christianity has become, albeit in a different context, even more politicized. Within many Orthodox communities, the internal discord over COVID safety protocols surrounding the Eucharist and veneration of icons and church shutdowns employed the same type of boundary making logics, but this time by members who were in communion with each other. In the case of COVID, the Eucharist, whether it has been restricted or consumed in faith, has, mobilized, has been mobilized by far right Orthodox folks as a political statement that highlights their anxiety over state interference the role of science and the charismatic presence of Christ in material form. Now, all of these issues gesture to the broader themes of communion, territory, and geopolitics that you raise in your article, Shauna and Vlad. And I think that your language of schism is actually quite useful and could be applicable as scholars begin to grapple with the religio-political effects of the pandemic on pan-Orthodox Christianity, an event that for me has brought to light the increasing radicalization of Orthodox Christian communities through far right ide ideologies of the body and state. And this I see particularly in the diasporic satellites of the Russian world where ideological schisms are created at a local level where anti-science, anti-intellectualism and fears over the deep state are tied to larger issues of global politics entrenched both in the Russian world and in networks of conservatism throughout the United States and Europe. I also wanna zoom out our lens a bit and think about issues of territory and claims of geopolitical power that your article brought to the fore. You write that by selecting the kingdom of God over this, over this worldly sovereigns, Orthodox Christians are seemingly able to transcend the institutional boundaries and divisions created by a politics of difference. I've been thinking a lot about this um, really rich idea since my, own, since my own work, worldly sovereigns or political actors are seen by Russian Orthodox converts through the lens of kingdom building, which is seemingly mapped onto the Russian world. In other words, earthly actors are playing on a trans-temporal stage that is not only home to Trump, Putin, the MP, the EP, Tsar Martyr Nicholas, but also the Antichrist. What does this trans-temporal nature of Orthodox spirituality mean territorially for the Russian world, given the forceful nature of the Russian Orthodox Church's placemaking and world-making focus? Widening, widening our lens out even a bit more, I wanna to turn to Mikhail's piece on geopolitical discourses of the Russian world and its ideological implications for our diaspora. Um, a diaspora that has either been glorified or marginalized very inconsistently in public rhetoric by governmental leaders, depending on the context and time. Mikhail draws our attention to how notions of the Russian world, which emphasizes Russia beyond the geopolitical and geospatial confines of the Federation, takes on a different expression when it comes to bear in its diasporic iterations. The nationalistic emphasis on beings tied to territory create ontological anxieties about immigrant bodies leaving Russia, often categorizing them perhaps as traitors or salvific defenders, paradoxically. The post-Soviet Russian governmental grapple with social politics of Russians abroad as part of the Russian world-making project uh, 
offers us new categories of inclusion and exclusion, who might be marked as compatriots and who might be dubious sellouts to the West. As Mikhail points out, Russians abroad or global Russians often adopt local customs and create hybrid communities. At the same time, this conservatism of the Russian world seemingly becomes more robust. For the globalized masses of Russians living in countries beyond Russia's geographical boundaries can become or should perhaps become in, in the ideologies of the state, uh, purveyors of the Russian world. And I am with you on this idea of, of global Russian citizens becoming instruments or tentacles, which I love that word, of soft power, perhaps even uh, more than soft power throughout the world. And I wonder now with the increasingly anti-Western values expressed in the Russian world, um, how, this, how these ideas of the Russian world are conveyed by globalized Russians who are actually part of the Orthodox Church abroad. And here I'm not talking simply about uh, Nativity and Pascha Russians, but Russian Orthodox Christians who are actively engaged in religious practices, both at home and the parish setting. How might the current Russian world ideology be broken, built, or deployed by them? Would their actions be expressions of religious messianism? And here I'm thinking of how converts I work with see Putin, um, the MP in Russia, as the arbiter of morality and traditional values in the world, as you mentioned. Is the Russian benevolence that you talked about an expression of the geopolitical ecology of the Russian world that is seemingly haunted by czarism and religious sovereignty? And taking it a step further, I know that you've written elsewhere uh, wonderfully about Holy Rus, and I wonder within the context of global Russians, what you might make of the American expat movement to Russia, especially with the civilization identity politics. In my work, the magnetic draw of the Russian world um, has become part of the geopolitical migration rhetoric for many converts in the United States. Uh, one interlocutor wrote to me, Russia uh, becomes like a lodestone for the compass of my soul. This from my vantage point is uh, an excellent well-marketed ideology of the Russian world coming to bear in the United States, but I wonder how this might be perceived in the geopolitical imaginaries of Russians. I'm also interested in the aesthetics of this geopolitical imagination. And I've been thinking about this quite a bit lately um, as I follow conservative nationalistic Russian priests wives on Instagram. The aesthetic allure of these women and their lives in Russia, which is highly curated to promote the religious and geopolitical importance of Russia globally, is consumed with great fervor and excitement by conservative Russia, uh, Western women. And I'm curious how you see the Russian world ideology um, aesthetically marketing to its publics. And finally, I'll, I, I will quit here because I wanna hear the other excellent comments. Um, but I have a, an overarching comment for all three papers. I think it would be um, immensely generative to think about the larger global optics of the Russian world since the project itself implies expansion, domination and empire. All of these issues are part of the larger circulation of neo-colonial power and subjugation that are embedded into the discourses of nationalistic world building uh, for so many nation states. And we've especially seen this um, during the Trump-Putin era. So I'm gonna stop here. I don't wanna run over time, but thank you so much for sharing your excellent work with us. And I look forward to your comments. Thank you. Thank you so much for those, yeah, really interesting comments, Sarah. I'm just going to point, just just take us back to that last thing you said, of course, this whole question of the neo-political power of nationalistic world, and the use of that. That's precisely one of the things that, that, that is impelling the entire project here. So I think it's worthwhile keep, uh, keeping that in mind. So thank you very much for that. Um, we're going to uh, move on our final discussants comments to Catherine Wenner, uh, Professor of History and Cultural Anthropology at Pennsylvania State University, author of, among other things, Burden of Dreams, History and Identity in Post-Soviet Ukraine, and uh, the, the multiple prize-winning uh, book, uh, Communities of the Converted Ukrainians and Global Evangelism. Uh, over to you, Catherine. Uh, Catherine, you're muted at the moment. <laughs> so sorry, I'm ra so rarely muted, but there we go. Um, uh, thank you to Victoria for the invitation to be here. Um, I think this uh, entire research project is fantastically interesting, and I really enjoyed the papers. Um, 
what I, I, I've been thinking about a good many of these issues for quite some time, uh, specifically about orthodoxy for the last 10 or so years. Um, and so I wanted to try to uh, think uh, more firmly about the Russian world itself and what it is uh, and what it might become, excuse me, sorry for that. Worse than students, right? <laughs> um, and I also wanted to um, go head on into the whole issue of um, what the theme of your overarching workshop is, namely aesthetics and persuasion, and to try to apply that to um, these three presentations. Um, I'd like to flip the order a bit and begin with Mikhail's presentation, um, which I very, very much enjoyed. Um, you note, um, in speaking, you notice that uh, Russian world is really a concept, and I agree quite uh, with you about that. Um, in your paper, you note, though, that um, the Russian world uh, is an ideology. That's how it presented itself, at least initially, um, which is quite different, really, when you think about it. Um, but it's a concept. I think that's a more accurate term, because, and it is a concept that posits, as you mentioned, that Russia um, not only is, but should be recognized as bigger than the Russian Federation. Um, your, uh, your presentation, though, raises the really interesting um, perspective that the Russian world has morphed over time and it has become something else. And so I would like to um, be, encourage you to think about what it might become next, because I think it is destined for another reinvention, if you will. Um, um, you noted, um, that initially it was meant to be a unifying concept, um, one that was centered largely on language. And it, uh, it, it picked up in many ways on the famous comment by uh, Josip Brodsky, Maya Rodina Ruski Yazik, you know, my homeland is the Russian language. And trying to pick up on the really the hemorrhaging of some of um, the Russian elite that were immigrating out of the country and to try to sort of reunify them, bring them back. Um, and in your written, written presentation, you note all the reasons why that effort um, was unsuccessful. In other words, those Russian speakers weren't necessarily, didn't necessarily see themselves as a diaspora. Um, there was no homeland because the homeland such as it was, was the Soviet Union, which no longer existed. And Russia was in the process of becoming um, something quite different. So in many, uh, in many respects, that initial effort uh, was unsuccessful. Um, and as a result then, uh, it began to morph into something, um, uh, the, the Großraum, which you mentioned. And I think this is a, a really original and interesting way of conceptual, conceptualizing it. Um, um, and this, of course, in terms of Großraum, it's going to rest heavily on the Orthodox Church. And this is where we get into Vlad and Jana's and then Victoria's presentation as well. Um, the Grosskam in several respects, it seems to me even that is under strain. And that's what makes me think that um, it will morph then beyond that. And what you mentioned as the first point in your uh, oral presentation here, the conservative communitarianism, um, I think this uh, connects you back to Victoria's presentation and really uh, perhaps, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, if this doesn't point the way towards what is likely to be the next incarnation of the Russian world. So if it's a concept, um, I, I really do think that it's a concept uh, that has morphed from being a unifier based on language to one based on this kind of Großraum with all of the sinister implications that that carries, uh, uniting the so-called Slavic Brotherhood. Um, but I mentioned that I think that's under strain um, because the that would then unite, let's say, Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus. And I think um, up until 2014, um, there might there would have been considerable currency for that in Ukraine, but I think the Maidan protests and especially the war has really shattered a, a sense of uh, Slavic brotherhood, 
And one need only look at what's going on in Belarus these days, and one wonders to what extent Belarus will go down a path similar to Ukraine. So in other words, whether yet another uh, pillar of the Großraum and of the Russian world conceived as such might fall away or, or at least become far, far less stable. Having said that, then we come back to what your original point was, the Russian world as um, this conservative communitarianism. And I think this is really, really a tremendously interesting Point that you're raising here. Um, and it really bespeaks a compendium um, of, uh, of corollary issues that stem from it. What I mean by that is if you think about uh, the Russian Orthodox Church as something that secures its authority uh, because it posits that it's based on tradition, unchanging, unwavering, pure kind of tradition. And as a result, you know, you mentioned uh, this idea that you're born into it. it. It cannot be changed. This then spills over um, into, for example, um, attitudes towards gender. And here I'm looking to loop in again, Victoria's and even the inherent um, appeal of the Russian world. Uh, and here now I'm speaking not just within Russia, but beyond. Um, uh, one of the, it seems to me beyond Russia, one of the big points of magnetism that the Russian world has is its um, anti-Gayropa uh, agenda, anti-homosexuality, and or put another way, the tremendous promotion of these kinds of uh, traditional values. Um, one of the big things that they have really um, argued uh, is that uh, one cannot choose gender. Um, uh, one is born male or female and there are subsequent uh, roles and identities and, and the like that stem from that. Um, this point and these kinds of conservative um, uh, values, be they centered on gender or uh, the kind of militarized masculinity that Victoria gets into, um, this is where we see uh, that Russia actually um, uh, is, is seen as something of a, a defender more broadly of those kinds of values. Um, I was an advisor to um, the Pew Foundation's a very large um, uh, survey that they did throughout Eastern Europe. And one of the most surprising findings was coming down to these sort of social values and social policies. Um, there was not only um, among Orthodox, predominantly Orthodox societies, uh, a lineup um, with those kinds of views espoused in Russia, but a great deal of um, currency given to Russia as being defenders. Once again, a, a phrase that comes back in Victoria's presentation, defenders of those uh, values. So whereas Russia, uh, Russia standing as geopolitical import in the world uh, on many levels might have shifted and made it, uh, to use Mikhail's word, uh, far more vulnerable, when it comes to the promotion of these very, very traditional uh, conservative values, uh, once again, it, 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 it becomes a leader. Um, and I would also encourage Mikhail to look, for example, in pursuit of that, um, especially that particular point, uh, the current work that Kristina Stokol is doing uh, in terms of the Russian Orthodox Church collaboration with the uh, World Council of uh, uh, Families, which sounds kind of innocuous, but it's nonetheless um, uh, an American evangelical initiative uh, that has married up with the Russian Orthodox Church to uh, promote precisely these kinds of, of values. Now, the other issue is um, uh, to what extent um, there really is any appeal in that. There's, uh, there's obviously a certain um, portion uh, of the population that responds to that, but within a Russian and even I would say a good bit of Eastern Europe, um, uh, one has to contend with the fact that these countries are in demographic crisis. I mean, the birth rate is falling. And so to what extent does this um, celebration of um, woman as the garter of family and, and hearth and uh, back to the old hero mothers, uh, to what extent are we really talking about some kind of nostalgia or mythology, something that really does not have um, much chance to um, 
uh, be realized. That is to say, on, on that aspect of it. I mean, when we get to the hyper-masculine and the militarized masculinity, which I'll get into with Victorious, then I think we're on far firmer ground. But it's important to note that this kind of um, conservative agenda has um, unbalanced kind of, uh, of appeal. But in certain parts of the world and among certain confessional groups, it really does have strong appeal. Um, and uh, I would just uh, encourage you, uh, I found the most uh, interesting uh, uh, points that you enumerated were especially your first and second, the commu uh, conservative communitarianism and the Großraum aspect of it. I think those are two uh, uh, original interpretations of the Russian world and it gets to the heart as to what it is. And it also shows how uh, especially when you link it up with the diaspora, just how fluid this concept is. Um, and that's, I think, its persuasive um, um, uh, qualities. In terms of the aesthetics, I mean, there, when it was based in language um, and, of course, illustrious uh, literary heritage that Russia can offer really the world, um, there's quite prominent aesthetics there. When you get into... Um, other reiterations, it, it, the aesthetic aspect of it, it is harder to, to identify in, in an appealing kind of a way, which is not in any way to discount the Russian world, but just to say that that, uh, that shift, it, it switches its, um, the medium of its persuasive capacities. Um, and I think it's switching it into um, the kind of militarized uh, aspect that um, um, Victoria gets into. Um, I wanted to also, um, I focused on um, Jean and, and um, Jeanne and Vlad um, note the um, theopolitics and you seem to center on the Russian world as a form of theopolitics. That's different from the kind of um, concept that Mikhail offers and the, the aesthetic depiction um, in, in an effort to create sort of a civilizational kind of tenor that Victoria goes into. Um, I read this. Um, I read this article um, uh, in manuscript form, and um, it's interesting to see uh, the the evolution of it in in your presentation today. Um, I would. Uh, I, I would, with all due respect, I would really encourage you to consider the effect of the war on, on everything from start to finish. I, I, um, I really believe you underestimate the import of the war. And if you want to look at theopolitics, um, especially on the Ukrainian side, the rhetoric of weaponizing religion, securitizing religion, uh, it takes many, many incarnations. Having said that, um, if you think about theopolitics and this kind of um, uh, using theopolitics to create uh, communities and canonical territories, um, you know, you wrote, I don't know exactly when you wrote the article, maybe 2017, 2018, I mean, so much has changed. And I think it's important to note perhaps um, what I see, and I'd be very interested in hearing your opinion, the diminished um, capacity of theopolitics to motivate and to uh, uh, shape events and actions. Um, I say that because um, several points. Uh, when, when your article, um, focus, which I would encourage everybody to read, it's in uh, Anthropology Today, or Anthropological Theory, right? Anthropology Today? Yeah, okay, sorry. Anthropology Today. I think of it as AT. Um, um, what you stress there is this, um, uh, the use then, the, the, uh, the mobilization, if you will, of the Russian world as a form of theopolitics to create sort of uh, uh, forced choices. Uh, you know, are you either with Moscow or with Constantinople? Um, and if we look at how that has played out, I mean, the Greek, or after quite some time, I might add, many, uh, the Greek Orthodox Church, uh, after quite some time, sided with Constantinople, as did Cyprus. 
and some other smaller denominations sided with Moscow. But of course, lots of denominations did not choose. That's one point there. Uh, you put up uh, the map. You didn't say what date that was from. But if we look at reaffiliations to the new autocephalous Orthodox Church, there was a, um, a flurry of them. I mean, over 500 in the first three months. And of course, the architects, those that pushed for the creation of this independence church, um, uh, not only hoped, I think they assumed this flurry would be uh, uh, an ongoing avalanche of reaffiliations, but it has not been at all. I mean, in other words, um, after this initial flurry, um, uh, we're down to really a, a, a trickle of reaffiliations. Um, and I think by, in many respects, this new church, I mean, it's still new, but it's sort of seen as yet another Orthodox Church to choose from. For those that might not know, um, Ukraine is unusual in that it has multiple Orthodox jurisdictions that are operative in Ukraine. Not just old believers, they're there as well, but um, this new uh, independent church, a church that claims to uh, be part of the Moscow Patriarchate, um, and a church that still uh, uh, retains its allegiance to the self-proclaimed Kiev Patriarchate. Um, there were prior to that churches that were <laughs> from the diaspora, which returned to Ukraine and that have folded into others. In short, it's a religious landscape that is tremendously malleable. Um, but basically you have a plethora of churches and you have an, an acceleration um, and, uh, of an ongoing phenomenon, which is what I'm researching right now, of growing numbers of people in Ukraine that refuse to affiliate with any of these churches and insist on calling themselves prosto pravoslavni, just Orthodox. They, uh, of course, uh, uh, see themselves as Orthodox and they recognize the different um, hierarchical structures in which these uh, a particular parish might be uh, embedded in, um, but they themselves refuse to choose. They are the single largest so-called confessional group in Ukraine, followed by those that call themselves, uh, uh, it's the new independent church, but then right on the heels of that is a group that calls themselves prosto Christiansky, just Christian. And then you have then uh, the other confessional truth. Uh, in other words, I wonder to what extent um, this kind of um, institutional infighting, which is real and which uh, does have, as your as your your presentation notes, these kinds of uh, pronounced geopolitical institutional reverberations. And let alone when you start talking about the war, <laughs> then it's really huge. So I, I don't mean to suggest that this is unimportant, but in terms of grassroots and Victoria looks at grassroots aspects of things and Michal's is much more political, but in terms of a grassroots, um, I think Jana's important article on uh, being a church of the unchurched, I think these kinds of machin institutional machin machinations are, um, I wouldn't go so far as to say irrelevant, but actively ignored. I mean, one, one tries to um, uh, push them away. So in that sense, um, I would encourage, I mean, in, in looking at, um, I would encourage you to perhaps think about your, 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 your article as uh, taking theopo theopolitics a step beyond. In what ways is this um, a force? And in what ways um, does this just have uh, very little credence? And it's an ineffective strategy. I might add, um, and, and here I come back to the war. I mean, it's important to note, historically the efforts to get an independent Orthodox church have been ongoing, right? They started right after the revolution. There was, a, uh, and those churches were uh, driven underground where they thrived in the diaspora, most notably in, in Canada, but also in the US as well. Um, and of course, after 1991, this is why we have a, a church of the Kiev Patriarchate. But, and the question is why did this church succeed in being established now when every single uh, president of independent Ukraine tried to get an independent Orthodox church? 
Poroshenko succeeded um, because of the war, because there was far more political will and there was uh, importantly far more popular will. And that's why he was able to push it through. Having said that, that guy was voted out of office with this being his signature you know, accomplishment. He was resoundedly voted out of office in a landslide months after uh, uh, this great accomplishment. And as I said, I mean, this, this church, I mean, the, the kind of crass instrumentationalization of religion in a theopolitical vein, while it um, uh, was enacted and continues to be used as, uh, if you will, uh, as sort of its own very hard, soft power in a hybrid war, um, it's, it's been less than uh, successful in an institutional vein. It's a, so in other words, as a means of persuasion, I think it's, uh, it hasn't been uh, very persuasive. Aesthetically speaking, and I wanna bring up this aspect of it, and this is where another, uh, another aspect of your research I think is tremendously rich. Um, you know, you guys focus on religious buildings and, and which, uh, which, which side are they gonna choose? And so if you think about buildings themselves and especially the aesthetic qualities of these buildings, um, uh, um, I'm reminded of, for example, the Dvesti of this initiative in Russia, which is really remarkable. Um, uh, 200 churches, the idea of um, uh, uh, vastly expanding the number of church buildings that exist. The idea was to build 200 in, in, in Moscow alone so that no Moscovite would be more than a kilometer from a church. Um, the, the enormous distances in Russia are, there's many reasons perhaps why people don't go to church, but um, uh, distance in some parts of Russia is clearly a factor. And they're looking to roll that back with this kind of uh, uh, program to build 200 churches. And I might add, I mean, they are succeeding as, as, as only the Russians could at a, a stunning rate. They claim to be completing in either renovation or building uh, three churches a day. Um, whether that's true or not, it's hard to know, but they, uh, they have exceeded their, uh, the 200 mark, uh, if nothing else. Um, and it's also important to think once again on the note of, of aesthetics. Um, those buildings perhaps might be a more um, persuasive form of bringing people into a Russian world such as it is, the very materiality of those buildings. And then especially to think about the aesthetics of those buildings. Um, um, there's other people here who, who perhaps know more about this than me, but uh, what I'm really struck about myself is the sort of the pre-Petrine architectural styles that these buildings come into, very, very old, ancient. And once again, going back to Michal's point about um, uh, traditional, unchanging, unwavering, uncompromising, true to the end, um, kind of like martyrs that way, um, that style. And then also in terms of Orthodox churches that are built abroad, the, the grandiosity of these churches. If you think about in Paris that, you know, you open your article with uh, Rue de Rue, I mean, these are like grand, grand, grand churches. Um, and that, you know, has persuasive, that, that, that communicates quite a lot in the very, the, the emphasis on buildings and in the aesthetic styles in which they're built. Um, oh, and what, I, I, I hope I'm not taking too much time, but there's one other question. I have been carrying this question around for me. It occurred to me since Vlad wrote his first book, which I guess was what, 2006. And I thought for 14 years, this question has been rolling around in my head. And now I absolutely must ask it. Um, Vlad, if, if those of you haven't read it, wrote a very, very interesting book in which he argued that there was in Ukraine an Orthodox imaginary. Um, this was a time um, when there was um, uh, an attempt to return buildings, once again, staying on the level uh, uh, of your, your your presentation and, and the actual looking at actual church buildings uh, and trying to, they had all been shifted over to the Russian Orthodox Church, which then became the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of the Moscow Patriarchate. And there was an attempt to uh, reapportion them, which was uh, 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 problematic for a whole variety of reasons. And so uh, Vlad posited that for people on the ground, they just imagined all these churches as essentially uh, interchangeable. They could go to whichever one. And at the time that, um, you know, uh, 
the Russian world concept was really in its infancy when you think about it in terms of really mobilization. I mean, the, the foundation itself wasn't um, created until 2007, one year later, even though Putin was already using it rhetorically. And I think there was a lived sense of orthodoxy as imagined in this kind of Großraum kind of a sense. And I always, um, un, uh, I wanted to ask you to what extent uh, you understood what the kind of orthodox imaginary you were positing on the Ukrainian side as really being an answer to the orthodox imaginary, imaginary on the Russian side that got eventually named uh, the Russian world uh, in this kind of Großraum kind of sense, uniting the, you know, the Slavic brotherhood of Russians, Ukrainians and um, um, Belarusians. And if this was uh, a response to that, that is one of the ways in which I always understood that um, um, uh, Orthodox imaginary in Ukraine arising. And secondly, as a rejection of the kind of theopolitics on another level that your paper is currently talking about. In other, in other words, a way of having orthodoxy be much purer to its aesthetic forms and aspects of its theology that don't get into the political aspect um, that inevitably uh, is very, very uh, contentious. Um, and that, as Mikhail says, you know, it, it might have attempted to divide, but it, 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 it might have attempted to unify, but it divides. And this then brings me to Victoria's paper, which I found also tremendously interesting. Um, if, if nothing else, because um, uh, soft power uh, inevitably becomes quite hard in Russia. And so perhaps given sort of the morphing of the Russian world from this language base to an institutional religious base, um, and, and having mixed success uh, on those two fronts, perhaps it's then not surprising that it takes this, um, if you wanna pick up on Mikhail's original point of this um, sort of unwavering, um, will not change, um, you get into this mode of um, uh, defense being and having enemies, clearly identifiable enemies, even if they're identified as, you know, let's say gay ropa or, you know, an anti-Western sentiment, we're likely to become, you know, a colony of the US or we're gonna be besieged by, you know, Islamic um, fanatics. Um, but this is then used to sort of forge a kind of uh, conservatism. And here's where I think, you know, this kind of aesthetics, um, uh, there's a definite appeal here. Um, and the, uh, I think this might be an avenue where we're likely to see um, growth of this form of persuasiveness operative, if for no other reason, then it courts a response in the same terms. What I mean by that is um, one can, I can observe in Ukraine and I'm already watching to what extent we'll see this in Belarus. Um, and that's just we're in the immediate Großraum, um, this kind of militarized masculinity and a celebration of fighters as defenders. Um, there's a very uh, strong emphasis in Ukraine on um, those who are in the armed forces as being defenders. And um, here you have then the theology of it all coming into it and discussing uh, because there is this sense of uh, brotherhood, if you will, and there's a really conflicted sense about killing these people, right? They are other Ukrainians, or if they're, uh, they, even if they're Russians, uh, you know, there's just so many people in Ukraine that have, you know, a Russian mother or a Russian grandmother or used to live in Russia, on and on and on. Um, and I'm watching the extent to which um, by positioning those fighters as defenders, that then you can say they're, they're responding to a higher moral calling rather than people who murder, and that's a sin. And so this use of um, defenders and the willingness to sacrifice up to and including one's own life in pursuit of this kind of militarized masculinity um, uh, I see replications of that, not to the same, not, it's not, um, I, I don't think it's flourishing yet to the same extent in Ukraine or in Belarus, but um, um, it, as I said, it does encourage a response um, in the same terms. In, 
I mentioned earlier sort of the World Congress for the Families and the collaboration with the Russian Orthodox Church and of course um, Sarah's work in, in the American South where you have these strong evangelical communities. Um, they also um, uh, speak in terms of um, uh, uh, you know, strong souls, strong, strong faith, strong bodies. And they're also notorious for, once again, going back to buildings to try to find a sort of a similar theme among all three presentations of having parish communities having these kinds of sports facilities. Um, and that um, in the Russian case, you know, it gets into um, uh, the Sorok Sorokov, um, a whole nother movement, which is, um, uh, once again, I don't think going to go away. <laughs> um, and whether we'll have the kinds of replications of these, uh, the ideas, uh, you know, 40 times 40, that, that they're looking to see, once again, the exponential growth of, um, of, of, of the church and of kind of a patriotism, but a patriotism that's clearly anchored in this militarized masculinity, highly gendered defenders of certain highly traditional values that cannot be chosen that are really in, inherited, inherited to, to use Mikhail's words. Um, I would also encourage uh, Victoria to then think about like looking at American evangelicals to what extent, because they're also all about patriotism and there's uh, a militarization to the extent that there's an exaltation of the US army and arms and, and service, in, but not so much the parishes themselves militarizing. But nonetheless, that might be an interesting point of comparison. And of course, is Israel is another um, point of comparison. Um, I, I think the uh, the important and uh, I'll, I'll stop soon because I don't want to take too much time. The other um, issue I would ask some uh, Victoria to think about is to what do you see as um, that might encourage this form of militarized masculinity and this kind of blending of um, of of orthodoxy with this. Uh, a militarized defense, uh, a whole constellation of, of, of factors. To what extent do you see that as having gone far more mainstream? Um, and it's not surprising that Sarah blends to Trump and Putin. I mean, we of course do see that in the US, this evangelical group that does manage to successfully uh, blend all of those um, factors into support for somebody like Trump, Trump who then further, uh, you know, tries to uh, directly or indirectly further them. Um, and I also want to, uh, you know, what might help that move, but what might hinder that too. And um, I think Jana's original work on the church of the unchurched, I think, thank God, that does put a little bit of a break on that kind of uh, tendency to see that, um, uh, um, in other words, they might build 200 churches, but is anyone gonna be there? Which is not to say people aren't religious, but is anyone going to sign on to these kinds of institutional things? Um, just a final word to support the, this overall workshop and the compendium of factors that you're looking at um, to the extent that um, uh, we see this, um, these forms of soft power being um, uh, really advanced in, kind, uh, in hybrid forms of warfare and one only need think about Moldova, Georgia, Ukraine, and their, uh, and of course Syria has come up earlier. Um, the it goes hand in hand. So in other words, these sort of soft, uh, which are really quite hard um, forms, um, I think court these other kinds of soft, but are really quite hard forms of warfare. They do go together, but they go together in ways for which we still, in many respects, don't have vocabularies to discuss. And one of the reasons why is because they use these soft indirect forms of persuasion that are, whether you're talking about architectural styles or, uh, or, or something um, uh, or, sports and the like, these are indirect ways that we don't necessarily equate with um, uh, kind of neo-imperialism or um, the, the, or warfare, and yet they, they do hang together. So that's a final word uh, in, in, in celebration of your efforts to look at the, um, the aesthetics of persuasion. So sorry if I took so much time.
Thank you so much, Catherine. And just to, I'm going to make pick up on one point because it's I think it's relevant. No Muscovite to be more than a kilometer from a church, uh, very similar uh, to the Redeemed Christian Church of God in Nigeria. No, nobody to be five minutes away from a church globally. Um, but this also links actually with something I think that Vlad and Jana did mention a couple of times in their paper, which is the idea of ambience and the, 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 the extent to which these churches may not have people coming into them. But there's a, there might be a kind of urban ambient aesthetic associated with those churches. OK, we've got uh, 41 minutes, people. So I need you to raise your hand and I'm going to take uh, uh, notes. Uh, I'll, I'll take that, that list of people who want to ask those questions. And I also want to give people, give those uh, all paper givers the chance to, to give more general responses at the end, including some responses to those fantastic discussants comments that we had. But I just want to make sure that we do give time for, for questions right now. So can people raise your hand if you, uh, I mean, kind of electronically raise your hand or you it physically as well, if you like, so that I can uh, see that you want to ask a question. So can I, okay, can I, uh, Jacob, I can't see if you're scratching your head or whether you're raising your hand. Simon, you see the blue icons for people that have raised their hands, I correct? Can, I can't see any blue icons. I can see, I can see Jacob, yeah. Okay, so I have Filippo, Augusta, and Jacob who have their okay. electronic I hands up, okay? You mind uh, doing that because I can't see any blue icon for some reason. So we've got okay. who? Jacob, Aaron. Jacob, uh, Jacob Augusta, Filippo, uh, Maria. Yeah, those are the people that I see right now with hands up. And Aaron, okay. Oh, and Simeon also has his, his real hand up. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I've, I've, I think I've taken note of those names. I'm going to try and uh, I'm going to allow for to begin with you to ask those questions very briefly each. So we get these responses and let's see how we go. Okay, I've got Jacob first. Hi, thank you so much. And thank you for uh, three wonderful presentations. I had a question for Victoria. Uh, you mentioned in your presentation about a kind of uh, unity between the missions of those fighting in Donbass and those fighting uh, against Chechens. And I was wondering, and using uh, Rodionov's kind of story to unite them. And I'm wondering if there's any, if, if uh, your, the people you spoke to uh, see any uh, tension or any, any kind of discrepancy between the fact that in one case they're fighting against uh, a Muslim, Muslim people, and in the other case they're fighting against uh, a lot of times fellow Orthodox Christians. So, yeah, feel free to answer. Thank you so much for the question, Jacob. It's a really good one because it gives me a chance to talk a little bit about some of the nuance of how Rodionov's story is being used in Russia today. When it first emerged, it was really in the, in the late 90s and early 2000s, a chance for the public to talk about the Chechen war and how it was handled. When a lot of people were really unhappy about uh, how the Russian soldiers were treated, how they were often either forgotten or declared deserters or were never given the pensions or some other promises that state was owing to them. But it has largely evaporated now. And in a certain way, Rodionov was abstracted from the entire context of the Chechen war. So when his story is brought up now, it really is a story about who was on the right side during that war or what that war was about or what was right or wrong you know, in terms of what was done to the civil population in Chechnya or to the Russian soldiers who were forced to go there, many of them. It is rather a very abstract story about duty and capacity to die for one's values or to remain loyal to one's values. And in a sense, even because the Chechen war is so complex and even among the Russian nationalists, you often don't see a single position on that. To all of them equally, Rodionov represents a person who, when put in an impossible position and in a very hard situation that was beyond his control, made the right choice, that is sacrificial choice, as opposed to betraying his friends or the mission of the army, he chose to die. 
And in that regard, this is precisely why it is so easy to now take and transport this story to any other conflict zone or context, because it's not a question of who is fighting whom or whether the confessional element is central to, to the conflict in question. It's just a story about loyalty, courage, and a certain form of spirituality and being faithful to oneself and one's values. I'll stop here. Thank you, Victoria. Um, I think looking at the time, let's take groups of some groups of questions. I'll take two questions at a time, okay? And then we will move on. So I think I've got Augusta and Filippo. So Augusta, let's have your question and then Filippo's question. Hi, um, I would just like to echo how great these presentations were. My question is also for Victoria. Um, I've been working on something similar with these images of so-called martyr soldiers. And I'm wondering, you mentioned at the end this question of authenticity versus state co-optation of these images. And I'd love if you could go into a little bit more depth on how you're thinking about this, the ways that people have responded to what they see as state co-optation and how the images have changed or if they have not in response to that. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And Filippo. Yes, I have a brief comment and then a comment, uh, a question for each of the presenters. And thank you very much for the fantastic papers. Um, the comment for everyone is, as we address the issue of arts of per persuasion, I wonder whether it might make sense to extend a little bit the way in which we use uh, uh, terms of ideas such as, for example, rhetoric and aesthetics. Um, as for rhetoric, I think that perhaps uh, it might make sense to, to think about the performative dimension of rhetoric as, for example, um, as it discussed, for example, by the late Jennifer Jackson, Jackson sorry, and Michael Carides, um, as a very productive uh, uh, political moment rather than just a sort of uh, um, ideological uh, move. Um, and, and to that also to add perhaps to think through uh, George Lakoff's work on, on political rhetoric. And, and likewise for aesthetics, perhaps it might make sense to move beyond the politics or representation of the aesthetics or representation. And to think here about perhaps through uh, Birgit Meyer's work on the aesthetics of persuasion, that thing, you know, the fo her focus there is on aesthesis that is the way in which you know, we, we, we perceive the world through our senses, perhaps a sort of pre-Kantian understanding of, uh, of aesthetics. Uh, my questions to, to, to the presenters are, are far more, uh, um, if you like, um, empirical though. Um, starting with Victoria, perhaps is, is completely out of my ignorance, but I'm curious, as to why, well, I would like to know as to whether uh, the Afghan war generated um, a similar uh, um, sanctification of, of martyr, or, of, of soldiers which have um, died during the war. And if not, as to why we, it didn't happen then, but it's happening um, later on. Um, to, uh, Jin and, and Vlad, um, I was wondering whether these uh, this politics and these processes of schism, um, whether they might be interrupted or uh, increased by the cult of saints or pilgrimage, um, as to whether that uh, might connect or disconnect people in in a in a particular way within the Orthodox Church, and that is. Perhaps also a question for Mikhail, uh, you know, within this idea of a greater Russia, you know, where do we place, you know, this sort of uh, holy places, uh, pilgrimage sites, saints, etc. And, but to Mikhail in particular, I have another question, which is, uh, given that we were encouraged to think um, comparatively, this project of a, of a sort of greater Russia, which is being articulated in this very complex way, and I think it was fantastic to, to listen to your paper, and you know, it, 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 I really learned a lot. But I was wondering, as 
to whether, you know, how we can compare it to similar projects. You know, there is, of course, an ongoing uh, project which is going on now for several years, you know, Greta Turkey, which is constituted through both language and religion. And likewise, there is another one which perhaps has been uh, less successful, which is of a greater India, uh, very much constituted through uh, history, culture, and religion rather than language. You know, is something, is there something that we can say more generally about this project, project of constituted greater uh, uh, um, assemblages around uh, states? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Philippa. Let me uh, allow each people, each person or group to respond. So we'll start uh, with uh, Jana and Philippe to those questions. Okay, Vlad, Vlad, would you like to start? Um, I mean, I think uh, briefly to to. Um, uh, Filippo put exactly the last point, but part of the reason, and maybe this answers something also that uh, Kathy and uh, Sarah uh, talked about, and thank you for your comments, is I, I feel in a, in a sense the article, you know, is, is thinking, trying to think it is about some tools in which, or, or the paper in, uh, about some ways in which the Russian world or any other world um, can be uh, um, accomplished or can be uh, created through theopolitical means. And we talk about two specific mechanisms there, canonical territory and, um, and communion and the, the, the schism uh, um, is, is the example for it. And these apply, so the, the um, the canonical territory that's where we start from outside uh, from outside uh, ukraine in fact and russia in paris uh, with this example of the russian church in paris because it shows how and uh, how the ideas about canonical territory have also changed to try to implement this russian world beyond russia and, and uh, beyond even the post-soviet context in a sense and and try to move from territory to ethnos and, and ethnicity Probably at the same time with uh, what Mikhail was saying, with the transformation of the uh, idea of the Russian world, also, um, and they are playing in, in through a kind of a neo-colonial uh, type of uh, uh, or imperialist type of logic that follows the so the ones the previous one, uh, Tsarist and then Soviet. Uh, Soviet. Um, so I and, and looking, you know, I, I think that looking from both schism um, as a means is, is a means through which um, um, you can think, um, like I, I just have in mind the Syrian Christians in India, right, and their history of schisms, uh, the schism is a mechanism to, to uh, create, break communities and, and change, uh, make new beginnings. Uh, but also territory and canonicity and where you belong to or you don't belong to. Um, and and the, the most interesting one is probably the communion part, which is part of the, our argument is about how communion is such a good means of persuasion, in fact, because it reaches all these levels. It moves from that, you know, that priest giving communion to a child and, and the family all the way to nation and belonging to the nation and and uh, and moving uh, to this big community uh, to which you belong the imagine community to which you belong whether it's orthodoxy pan orthodoxism or whether it's the uma or any other kind of global imagine community created today i have many more things to say but this was just uh, and so it also in a sense it, it also the the whole work tries to move beyond Ukraine and don't not think about the specificity of Ukraine, but how this kind of geopolitical uh, formations work in other places, uh, could work or work in other places too. Yeah, I think I will not add anything because I, I just want to uh, hear more questions maybe. Great, okay, so uh, Victoria. 
I will try to be brief and I'll start with Philippa question about Afghan war and the differences and why it did it has not generated similar forms of martyr figures. I think that's a relatively easy question to answer. Firstly, we need to think about the importance of the orthodox revival that was happening during the Chechen war that made it even possible to think in terms of orthodoxy and martyrdom and which made the very story that the soldier was wearing a cross and was killed for wearing a cross appealing in the first place to, to the public, whereas it couldn't have necessarily been made public or make much public sense to, to the Soviet audience. And another important factor is I think, even though there are a lot of similarities between lack of public understanding about the purposes of both of these conflicts, and Russian intervention or Soviet intervention in Afghanistan, still ideology was stronger in the Soviet times. So there was a clear understanding why these soldiers died. What did they die for? They died for, for the Soviet state and for the Soviet ideals and for the attempt to help the brotherly nation of Afghanistan. Whereas in the context of the Chechen war, there is simply completely no understanding for a lot of people as to why it is happening. What are these young men who are forced, who are conscripted and sent to fight are dying for? And in a way, to, to use the orthodox dimension was a, was a way for the public to make sense of Rodion of sacrifice. It was not the sacrifice necessarily for the state or for the corrupt army commanders who betrayed him, but it was for orthodoxy or for some kind of higher purpose. And uh, to briefly comment on Augusta's question, thank you so much. It's a great question. And this notion of captation is something I'm working on right now and still thinking through. So it's very much work in progress. But I, what I was trying to do in the context of this presentation is to kind of contrast the cult of Rodionov, which is very much grassroots. There are some small attempts like with Dmitry Sablin to, to co-opt it and to use it for broader purposes. But still it's very much supported by patriotic enthusiasts, and that's it. And other forms of public commemoration that are more institutionalized, like the World War II commemoration, which entirely was taken over by the state. And now that, that process of captation caused a lot of tension with, in the patriotic circles among the people who believe in authenticity and believe that they were the one who truly represents the authentic activism, whereas now the state is just using and mobilizing these images for a show or for propaganda, that certainly creates conflicts. And I would like to see in my future work about how this plays out for different audiences and to what point indeed, you know, this captation and institutionalization destroys the appeal of conservative culture because it's just a hypothesis at this point, but we, we need to see what happens. I, I, it's a strong hypothesis, but nonetheless not, not proven. And I'd be happy to talk more about it over Slack. Hey, yes, good mention of Slack there. Okay, Mikhail. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Filippo, for a great point and question. Uh, yeah, Russia's right-sizing, we have this term right-sizing when the state wants to change its territory. Russia's right-sizing is pretty unprecedented in terms of its uh, determination and kind of physicality of annexation of Crimea. But uh, if, you, if we think about the broader frame, uh, the enlarging the scale, enlarging geopolit of the geopolitical scale is pretty much present everywhere in the world. And we have two ways in which it is present. First is continentalisms, and we have pretty many continentalisms uh, in the world. Think about European Union, but also think about North American uh, free trade area, right? Or Mercosur, UNASUR, or African Union as of 1999. Uh, another frame in which right sizing makes sense, yeah, also I did mention uh, some high cooperation organization, of course. Uh, another frame is um, what is um, pointed, at, pointed at in the book by Milbark and Pops, a relatively recent book from 2016. They are writing about this precise um, cultural, cultural areas on the place, in the places where empires previously existed. So they spoke about these uh, cultural areas uh, in place of uh, the British Empire, French Empire, Spanish Empire, and uh, no, of course the, the, the Russian Empire as well. Uh, but it's more kind of cultural thing. Uh, so yeah, um, Russia's attempts of right-sizing are not just uh, from, from the blue. They are 
grounded. Thank you. Um, I reckon I've got Maria, Aaron, Angie, Simeon, and Valentina, and we've got uh, 21 minutes. So just to let's focus. So uh, Maria and Aaron, let's, you're next. Maria first. Thanks, Simon. Thank you all. Um, an incredibly rich set of papers. And um, I, I, I work on uh, Christianity and late antiquity, and I read the homilies of church fathers probably invoked in the rhetorics of the groups that you study here. I specifically work on the Cappadocian fathers. And a lot of what I work on are martyr homilies. Um, and so a lot of this stuff is resonating big time with me, um, particularly in the response, this question of building campaigns and the strategies of persuasion involved in things like the building of shrines and, and church buildings, the aesthetics of these buildings, these, these kinds of strategies are explicitly actually mentioned in some of the homilies by these fathers uh, who talk about the persuasive capacities of the art, artworks inside, the relics, um, but also who talk about how Christianization of regions can be tracked by the building, the, the multiplication of shrines, martyr shrines across the countryside. So, many resonances. Um, that said, uh, I have two sort of question comments. Um, one is sort of building from Vlad and um, and John's uh, paper, um, which I, I like this idea of communion as this sort of like touchstone for both this idea of communion that's disrupted by various schisms, but also the actual, you know, physicality of it. Um, and, and how that sort of presides and sort of messes with um, the, the, the schisms that happen too. Um, and I actually want to link it to another important touchstone that I wonder if it's still a thing in these contemporary situations, which is relics. Are relics still um, in circulation here? Are they important and do they, do they matter? Are they invoked in the same ways? Because um, yeah, they, they're heavily laden and there's a lot of affect around relics as well. And Victoria, I wanted to ask you the same sort of question in this story of this martyrdom. Uh, you mentioned meeting at grave sites for, you know, memorial services, but are the relics, you know, have, have, have the boys relics been unearthed? Are they in circulation? So thank you, more comments than questions. <laughs> Thanks, so, thanks so very much. Um, my question has actually been partially answered and I'll save the rest for Slack to, to make room for others. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Erin. So let's move straight on to Angie and then we'll get some responses. I have a general question for everybody. Um, so I know that one of the key kind of organizing terms for the workshop, and this is not to say that no one did it or you know that you didn't do what was asked for or something like this, but it was neoconservative. And I'm trying to understand what that term is doing in each of your papers, if it is a term that is being engaged or if not neoconservative right or far right. Um, and I'm wondering if it's a useful kind of um, exercise to think of what the counterpart of neoconservative would be. And here I'm inspired by Victoria's paper because Victoria, you, you, in, your dis, in your definition of moral conservatism, um, you gesture to kind of um, a post-Soviet specific history of cynicism and kind of formalism and that moral conservatism in, in a certain sense is a response or at least imagines itself, the actors and agents of moral conservative uh, ideologies imagine themselves to be um, opposing the, a kind of politics of cynicism. I wouldn't, I would venture to say that maybe that uh, coincides, for example, with um, converts to Russian Orthodoxy in American Appalachia, rural Appalachia, or not. Um, I, I, I also am thinking about the politics of schism um, in Vlad and Jana's uh, paper. Um, I, I'm wondering if, if it's, a, it's ecumenism or a kind of a liberal politics of ecumenism that's, that's being gestured um, at as the kind of counter uh, movement for um, uh, the, the, the advocates for um, the Crimean annexation. So I, I'm just trying to understand um, what, is the what is the term conservatism signaling 
in the papers and to what extent they're transposable, um, just to make sure what it's not in kind of empty placeholder and what kinds of questions can emerge as a result of interrogating that term. Thank you, Angie. And I think that question of what conservatism is, is going to actually reach across all of these workshops in some fascinating ways. OK, uh, quick responses, please. Um, and then we'll have our final round of questions, starting off with uh, Jeanne and Vlad. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for your questions, Marie and Angie. And uh, uh, to answer to Maria's question about relics, the, uh, the simple answer is, of course, relics are there, very much so. They are important, but uh, this is a question of how this, you know, people who now belong to you know, different churches, the Ukraine one and the Moscow one, do they venerate the same relics? This is a question, but I, I, again, I have an answer, a partly answer to this because the main, maybe the main um, pilgrimage center in Ukraine, in Kiev, Kiev Pichersky Lavra, it is divided between two uh, owners now. One owner is the uh, like uh, Russian or the uh, well, Ukrainian Orthodox Church of Moscow Patriarchate of Moscow Patriarchate, right? The Russian Church, and another owner is the uh, state um, state supported museum. So it's a U Ukraine state, right? So it's divided between these two very interesting actually political motives. So between the Ukrainian state and the almost Russian church. And there are a lot of relics there. So this is, a, this is an answer. And answering to Angie's question about the conservative politics, well, actually, I don't, maybe, maybe Vlad can help me, but uh, I don't remember that we were really focusing on the new conservatism in our, in our, uh, in our paper, because uh, I'm not sure who is conservative and who is liberal in all this, you know, things, because I, I do know for sure who are liberal from the Russian side. They were liberal Orthodox people in Russia who were very much against the schism. They were those who were thinking ecumenically about this. They would prefer not to have different orthodoxies. They would even prefer to have the whole you know, field of uh, traditional Christianity. So they are those who want to uh, have communion together with Catholics. Yes, so, and they, are, they were quite vocal. They were quite uh, present uh, in, the, in, the, in the discourse uh, about the schism. And the, and the first picture which you had, the wonderful one, where you had two Jesus Christs, right? Uh, giving this communion to two like communities. It was borrowed from the Facebook page kind of, of one of these guys of the liberal Orthodox people. But to be liberal Orthodox does not mean to be real liberal, right? Not, doesn't, does not mean to be politically liberal. It's a very complicated thing actually. So I will stop here, okay? If Vlad wants to add something then. No. Okay, uh, thank you, Victoria. Thank you for the questions. I'll start with Maria's question on relics because it's a short answer. Shortly, no, the, the remains have not been unearthed. Firstly, because the soldier wasn't canonized. And secondly, because his mother is still alive. And she, although she herself converted to orthodoxy, is strongly opposing to any conversation about uh, using him for relics or unearthing the grave in any way. So as long as she is alive, I'm pretty sure that this will not happen. Uh, moving on to Angie's question about conservatism, it, I, I'm grateful for this question. It's a very important one. And again, this is one of the things that is still work in progress for me in terms of how I think about it. I, in this paper, presented the definition of moral conservatism in the Russian context. But initially, I developed this context as something that is not confined to the Russian case, but as a broadest possible label for thinking about the movements that we usually classify as either conservative, never conservative, right wing, far right, you know, the full spectrum, the distinctions are important between them. But I also feel like all of them do have something in common. And this like basic common denominator would probably be some kind of search for the moral world. And moral is an emic term for them. That's what they talk about. They're looking for a way to have a more to consciously construct a moral society or have a more moral life. And in that regard, I think maybe moral conservatism, maybe the conservatism part here is not necessarily fair. And I might want to reconsider that. 
because I think we always think about conservatism, and that goes to, to also some of the comments from Sarah and Catherine about, you know, how the connection between orthodox and militarism happens, or, you know, the global processes of reaction to alienation, marginalization of religious public by the secular societies, and some forms of oppression against certain forms of Islam in Europe, for instance. Yes. There are a lot of reactions to a lot of things, and much of it is driven by a reaction to, to economic transformation, social transformation, to a very rapid cultural change and the culture wars and the change in gender, family norms, and so on. But one idea I did want to, to, to bring across is that we also should think beyond reactions, because I think for many of these people, this is not just a reaction, but it's an attempt to the way they put it, find themselves. A lot of my informants I encountered didn't start off as orthodox, but they narrated to me how they came to orthodoxy and they came by searching, right? It, it was the people who felt that secular society or liberal society or democracy is missing something, something is lacking. There is no transcendence within this order. And these are people who are looking for some kind of transcendence. And they end up with very different ideologies. Some end up with religion, others don't. Some might end up with some radical group, others don't. Again, this is a very, very broad process, but I think that process happens to a lot of people. And the key question that remains here is precisely, so who are the people who search in the first place? Because so many people do not search for some bigger thing, right? And in a sense, they are happy with having a more secular lifestyle or even consumer lifestyle, or they find realization within themselves or within their career or family. So I think the, the biggest question that I hope to tackle one day is by looking comparatively at all these moral conservative movements, who are the people joining them and how do they even start on this path of searching in the first place? Sorry for a longer answer. I'll, I'll stop here. Thank you, Mikhail. Uh, yes, I would like to reflect on Andy's question about conservatism because it's pretty central for my own reflection about the regime ideology and it kind of kept me busy for quite a while. Uh, there is a concept uh, of conservative term, turn, which is so much entrenched in historiography and many uh, specialists in Russian politics and ideology use it. I think I'm, I'm kind of emphatic here. I think that we can speak about the conservative turn from conservatism and not towards conservatism. What do I mean by this? Um, in my understanding, and here I ground my analysis on Michael Frieden, uh, conservatism has a quite specific and uh, uh, clear cut core concept, which is the concept of organic change. So if you believe that the society should grow organically, that any kind of artificial rational planning should be avoided, then you're on the conservative side. If you accept that uh, some wise man can plan artificially, politically, uh, some meaningful changes in your society, then it's not conservative any longer. Uh, so I, my claim, my contention here is that um, the Russian political regime in 2009 came up with the conservative ideology, which was the official ideology of the United Russia party. They adopted the program and it was stated there explicitly, our ideology is Rossiyski conservatism, Russian conservatism. And what they meant is precisely like what I described. So um, conservative modernization adopted after um, Dmitry Medvedev's article and the idea that that uh, Russia should preserve best achievements of the liberal reforms of the 90s. And this is purely conservative position. It's kind of 100% conservative. But what happened after that, it was reorientation from conservative to something else, which is probably moral conservatism, yeah. I would rather dub it um, identitarian radical conservatism because what they proposed after, after uh, this pseudo conservative term is actually not conservative, but a restoration, radical restoration project, kind of rolling back modernization and coming back to some kind of imaginary past, which has nothing to do with conservatism per se in the strict sense of the word. Yeah. 
Thank you so much. Okay, we're going to finish up with two sh short questions, one from Simeon and then one from Valentina. So oh, hello. So can you hear me? Yes. So hello everybody. It's great to be part of all this. So uh, I, I try to be uh, very brief. Uh, we use this notion of uh, revival and I'm using myself in my work on orthodoxy in Romania. So I'm wondering about the way in which we have to qualify and to clarify it a little bit. Uh, Jana and Vlad talked about the parallel, uh, about the parallel between 1990 revival and 2000 revival. Uh, Victoria talked about the moral conservatorism as a cause, as both a cause and a result of a revival. So I'm wondering, what do we mean by revival in, ter revival in, term in, uh, in, in the case of orthodoxy? On the one hand, we have this notion, which is very uh, Western notion, uh, Christian Western notion of revival, which involves intentionality, ethical engagement, conversion, self-sacrifice, strong faith, all these kind of uh, very, very uh, uh, formative uh, uh, notions in terms of uh, subjectivity. On the other hand, uh, for example, Cathy Warner talks in, in an article about uh, an effective an atmosphere, uh, atmospheric uh, religiosity. So we have, we can, in, in, in the case of orthodoxy, we can conceptualize revival in this kind of very loose and uh, very soft uh, uh, terms. So I'm wondering if, we, 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 if we not tend to, if we tend to uh, uh, disconnect in the case of the orthodoxy, this, this uh, two understandings of, uh, of revival. So I, I, would, I would like to, to hear uh, your comments, especially, for example, uh, Victoria talks about more conservatorism and I'm, I'm wondering in, in what way we can compare this to the cult to the sincerity culture in charismatic Christianity. So in what way this, uh, I'm using, for example, in my work, this notion of conversion to tradition. So revival as a form of conversion to tradition, not from tradition uh, in a sense. So I'm, I'm wondering about this, this uh, qualifying and clarifying uh, the notion of uh, revivalism and revival. Thank you. And actually, just to note, of course, revival is going to be absolutely key when we think about Islam in the next in the exactly. next work. I want yeah. Latin America in the one after that. OK, uh, Valentina, you're going to. Oh, I am. Not, last... I'm just going to let go of the question. I'm just making a comment of something that really stuck on me for, for a bit. The octopus. <laughs> well, it's very interesting thinking about the acephalus dimensions, thinking about the octopus as, you know, the intelligence of the hands and thinking about the Benedict option. Sorry, I'm just going very like that. Benedict options, we think about, you know, the work of uh, Dreher, you know, the, the kind of option of the very radical Christianity towards sort of Benedict tin modes. So there is something about modes of living that become very radical and they become not just anymore acephalous, but like, I don't know what, how to describe an intelligence unit. Um, spiritual intelligence unit. So thinking about this, you know, questions that Catherine was asking, it's very important. Thinking such sort of as a prognosis of what is going to come. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm going to let Mikhail be the first person to answer this 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 time round. You're muted, Mikhail. There we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, yeah. Um, uh, I think that I uh, I will suspend my judgment right now. <laughs> I'm fine with what you said. So. Victoria, are you going to respond? Oh, there we go. Yeah. Uh, just very brief. I think Simeon is bringing up an important distinction and how we think about revival first as a process, you know, there is a certain trend that is happening. And in the Russian case specifically, it's certainly supported by the state and promoted by a very powerful institution, you know, the extension of the Orthodox and its presence in the public sphere. 
And the second is, yeah, this genuine, very emotional moment when people feel that something is happening, whether it's a new beginning or revival, and they're excited about it. And of course, these moments don't last very long. They always kind of a post-revolutionary or post some kind of event moments that tend to fade. And what is left is a structure or an institution that becomes a routine inevitably. So specifically in my work, when I speak about revival, I, I only use it in the first sense as a broader trend. Certainly there is a kind of trend with the spread of specific type of discourses, practices, and forms of behavior, which is part of both orthodox culture and the broader moral conservative trend. I'll stop. Yeah. Thank you. And Vlad and Jana. In 20 seconds? Or yes. Less. <laughs> Thank you for the challenge. So, I, I mean, Simeon and I had the long conversations about these things uh, for a long time, I think. And uh, we, one of the, for me at least, one of the stakes of, of trying out this, this argument in a short article, which is too short and too limited. To, to actually make a, a, a strong argument was the fact that um, I, you know, coming from the post-socialist religious revivals, we know we knew that they were not revivals in a sense. So, so whatever it was, it, it was uh, there were forms of mobilization, political and religious and social mobilizations happening at the time, which looked very similar to to later events, but they were never treated in, sense, in a sense as political mobilization. That was my problem um, until the uh, realizing that with the Orange Revolution, when, you know, religion was not really, so religion didn't seem to play a role. It seemed to run separately from what was happening around that. So partially what was the, the answer, like, I don't think I have a, um, one answer, but I, what I can say is that uh, rather than thinking about revival or using the term revival, um, what we've been trying to do now with this was to think of ways to um, analyze revivals, right? Mobilizations, what mobilizes people, what forms the way you can persuade and, and create these this effective publics, I think, because not everybody's active, but everybody's present and everybody is, is affected or everybody, a lot of people are affected. And 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 um, and, and I, I think Cathy's work, that the one she's been doing since then, and also Simeon's work, which I didn't mention, Ms. Simeon pushed us to, to think about communion seriously. In fact, in, in this, are 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 taking this much further ethnographically than what we've done in, in a very short piece. Uh, but the, the 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 ways to analyze the means to analyze the revivals, at least within orthodoxy and think if, if it reaches beyond that uh, are, are somehow uh, you know, explored in, in, in our work, in our text. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. If you don't mind, I'm going to try and wrap up in two minutes. Thank you to, to everybody for, for staying uh, uh, for, I think, a fascinating set of papers and discussants comments. Um, many people may well have questions or comments to make. We didn't have time for you, so please use to give us some comments, comparative question, uh, questions or conferences that you may have that are relevant. And I noticed, for instance, in the chat that Vlad, you, Vlad, you mentioned a fascinating paper by Kathy on the role of prayerful places in Ukraine's divided orthodoxy. So either you or Kathy, please put it on Slack so we can all, all have that reference uh, and, and, and have a look at it. Uh, a couple of other things. Sorry, yeah. Um, is um, watch this space email or Slack for us telling you more about our photo competition, uh, looking, thinking about images, reflect on images in relation to the themes. We will be uh, mentioning those and talking much more about that. Um, I, Aaron also, another example of networking. Aaron, I think you may have something quickly to tell us about an AAR panel, is that right? That's right. Very, very briefly, um, I just wanted to invite you all, uh, if you're registered for the AAR, to a panel that is closely related to the aims of this network. And three of us are, are on the panel, involved in the panel. Victoria has been involved from the very beginning. So this is Saints in Divided Societies. It's on um, this Thursday at 11 Eastern. So I, I'd encourage you to come. I think the conversation will be closely resonant with with everything that's that's gone on here. I'm just so glad to be part of the network and hope to see some of you at Saints and Divided Societies. 
Thank you so much, Aaron. Okay, it's 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 now down to us to use the media to create our own aesthetic persuasive formation using Slack and the website and uh, uh, our future workshop, which will be in the new year and then we'll, one after that in April. But for the meantime, thank you so much, everybody. I really enjoyed it. I hope you did too. I thought that was a great start. And see you all soon. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you.